Good evening. I'm Eula Clark, Mayor of the City of Stewart, calling to order the regular meeting of the Stewart City Commission on July 26, 2021, 5.30 p.m. We're a little bit past that appointed hour at 121 Southwest Flagler Avenue in Stewart, Florida. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mayor Clark? Yes. Vice Mayor Matheson? Yes. Commissioner Bruner? Here. Commissioner McDonald? Here. Commissioner Meyer? Here. Thank you. Can I stall, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Recognize our own presence in this room. And let us wait for our Vice Mayor to lead us in unison in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mayor. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First item is our comments by City Commissioner, Commissioner Bruner. No, I'll pass. Commissioner McDonald. I have nothing tonight. Thank you. I mean, Commissioner Meyer. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to thank my colleagues for joining us at the Treasure Coast Council of Local Government's annual luncheon in Okeechobee. Last week it was uh, for a nice presentation for some good food. Um, we weren't able to do it last year, and uh, I just love getting the local electeds along the Treasure Coast together just for a little bit of fun. Um, next week, I will be heading to the, um, or no, I'm sorry, the following week, I'll be heading to uh, Orlando for the um, Florida League of Cities annual conference. Um, I'm on the resolutions and the legislative committee uh, where we'll be approving all of the um, policy priorities for the league from my committee group, as well as all the other uh, the other four committees. So once that is approved and voted on by the general body, I'll bring those back to y'all uh, for our policy priorities for session coming up in January. It's gonna be here before we know it. Um, and uh, that's all. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Thank you so much, Vice Mayor. Um, uh, thank you, and- Mayor Matheson. And thank you to our local homeroom hero, uh, the Lunch was excellent, I have to say, uh, as it always is. Uh, it was a pleasure going out there and, and seeing that meeting take place in Okeechobee. Um, I wanted to thank Ann Ellig um, for all the work she did in putting together um, us as a location sponsor for the Treasure Coast Waterway cleanup, and thank all the city staff that came out and. Um, helped round up trash um, and thank my family for putting up with me dragging them out for another year um, you know we we probably filled up you know by my estimate five or six easy large trash bags in in short time uh, all found along our river um, I also was fortunate enough to notice a downed no wake piling and sign floating in the channel just outside the Roosevelt Bridge. Um, and I let our staff know and, and uh, hopefully no boats hit it. Um, but odds are a boat did come in contact with it that morning. That's probably why it was down. Um, Mr. Leggett just informed me it's on the, it has been pulled out of uh, the way of any boat traffic. It's at the, the boat ramp now. Um, Tomorrow at City Hall here, we are hosting the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, they are doing their listening tour for Colonel Kelly and the Corps' decision um, on the loathsome plan of CC for their per preferred alternative. Um, that model reduces <coughs> regulatory flows to the St. Lucie Estuary by about 67% from what we've been getting in, in Lowers 08. Um, 
it's not zero. And the job of fighting for our waterways won't ever be done until it's zero. And then we have to consider all the other sources of polluted water that are coming into the St. Lucie that aren't from our own tidal basin runoff. Um, but an improvement, a reduction of, of 67% or so is incredible. Um, the real work comes over the next few months when they actually draft the plan based on the model that they've created um, and draft the operations of, of how they're going to get to that point. Um, and so tomorrow is, is part of the Corps' listening tour on, on the choice of that model and an opportunity for uh, project delivery team members, which I and Mr. Hogarth are one that represent the city of Stewart and others to give input to the core as, as far as how they would operationally uh, make adjustments to that model. Um, again, thank you all. That's, that's a plan that city of Stewart advocated for and, and supported. It's the best all around plan for the entire water flows um, of South Florida. Um, and we'll keep advocating for it. The, the work is not over. Um, Losum won't take effect till the end of 2022 to coincide with the Her Herbert Hoover Dyke uh, full completion. Um, but that meeting, again, Colonel Kelly here with the Army Corps um, tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Mayor, can I ask you a quick question? Uh, with the reduction of 62%, 64 percent, uh, say 60 plus percent. Yeah, 65 plus that, or minus. That doesn't include the projects, other projects like the, like the uh, Re Southern Reservoir and S in, uh, in the C44 Reservoir, those projects, in, uh, water farming, that's in addition to those reductions, or the, does that incorporate those into it? The C44 doesn't reduce much discharges from us. What it does do, it, it will reduce in a way um, water, there'll be an interconnect canal by about 2025, and it will help, that interconnect will connect the C-23 uh, basin uh, that flows into the North Fork, and they'll be able to divert that water to the C-44 and into the C-44 reservoir. Um, that modeling, though, the, the C-44's reductions, as far as reducing regulatory flows, only equate for about 8% total. Um, so there's, there's not much major benefit with the C-44. Hopefully this year when it first kicks on, it might squeeze us out of the way of discharges if we get a hurricane. Right now the lake's at 13.53 feet, um, and the C-44 reservoir will be coming online in the next couple weeks. The EAA reservoir is not factored into any of that model. So when that comes on, that'll be a reduction. That should okay. be a, a major was, reduction. That's what I thought. That's what I was hoping for. And that, yes. So, uh, I mean, I'm, uh, frankly, I'm much more optimistic as long as Losum keeps going um, the best, f you know, for the en environmental uh, stakeholders in Florida, I think, um, I'm much more optimistic about where our water quality will be in the future than I was four or five years ago. Um, so, um, other than that, let's see. We talked about the Corps Media. I did mention the lake height, and we're just watching major name storms that can throw a wrench into to where we stand with that. But right now, there's no regulatory discharges uh, of Lake Okeechobee our way on the horizon. Um, and that's all, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Ms. Bruner and Mr. McDonald for yielding their time to me. They didn't say that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be long, so be prepared. Um, <clears throat> I, I just want to start off by saying that uh, today I had a uh, message from Gwen, um, Gwendolyn Brinkley, 
and she's not going to make it to the city commission today. I think she said she might do it by Zoom if she has a chance. But it is um, almost a joy when residents are so interested in the city and they're so interested in participating. And when they can't make it, it's like, oh, I can't see it, like my favorite TV show or something. So I'm glad that there's that interest in the city. And I appreciate Ms. Brinkley for her participation and uh, her input. So on that note, we have bigger and better things going on in the city. <clears throat> and I will just stand to make my announcement that our city of Stewart has joined the ranks of hosting the Cal Ripken World Series. And this is the first time, drum roll, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. So um, Babe Ruth League is celebrating its 70th birthday in 2021 and will be hosting some of its youth World Series games in Martin County and in the city of Stewart. In honor of this special milestone, we anticipate that close to 10,000 people will be coming to the Treasure Coast to be part of the festivities. <clears throat> the World Series games will take place at Pineapple, Halpatioke, Sailfish, and Citrus Grove Parks from July 18th to July 6th. This is also, of course, I said, the first year for the city hosting these activities. And our Sailfish Park, which as you remember a few years ago, we were almost going to get rid of that, will be the host facility for the nine and under division of the Cal Ripken Baseball Tournament. Six girls youth softball divisions and a second youth baseball division will also be playing at public parks in Martin County during this period. The teams will be arriving at the Stewart area at the week of July 25th, which is right now. And the tournament will begin on July 31st with a salute to service day. Past and present military members and first responders will be recognized and one will be selected to throw out the first pitch for each game. Normally they'd ask us to come to the park, but I think on this Thursday they're going to have a big Treasure Coast event at the, um, what used to be the Port St. Lucie Civic Center it's now the um, Jim Cross will tell me the name of it again. Mid Florida. The Mid Florida Center. And uh, we'll be, some of us will be going up there for their event when they start the official thing. So, again, let's just give ourselves a round of applause for being the host for the Cal Ripken. <laughs> Thank you. I'm also going to be doing a lot of little reading. But um, <clears throat> before I continue with my reading again, as uh, Vice Mayor Matheson said, I um, just want to thank those who helped out with the, um, the waterways cleanup as well as the street cleanup, which was not part of the bi-monthly cleanup in East Stewart. They did that. And um, <clears throat> it's just so great. I know that Ann Ellig is here somewhere. Okay, Ann is here. And maybe if you ever want to give a chance to, did you bring a video of anything that was done? Nothing, but um, how many pounds did you collect, Dan? Yes, we want to hear this. <laughs> uh, Mayor Clark, we don't have the totals in yet, but we did fill a four-yard dumpster overflowing, wow. and then the East Stewart community uh, simultaneously doing a cleanup. I believe their dumpster was three-quarters filled, so a lot of trash was removed from our water and our streets on Saturday. So Thank great you. job for all. Thanks. I'm glad that we're picking up the trash, but I'm kind of worried that we're creating so much trash. So maybe we need to find some ways to deal with some other areas. But thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to read something just into the public record, just to be sure. This came into us earlier this month on July 12, 2021, from the Department of Economic Opportunity, Honorable Mayor from the City of Stewart. This is regarding the Small Cities Community Development Block Grant CDBG Program, Federal Fiscal Year 2019 Housing Rehabilitation Funding, and the contract number. 
Dear Mayor Clark, the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity is pleased to inform you that the City of Stewart has been awarded $750,000 through the Small Cities Community Development Block Grant Program. Your community may begin working and incurring costs on your project beginning August 1, 2021 through January 31, 2024. However, reimbursements for any costs incurred can only be requested after the subgrant agreement has been signed by all parties, and I think we've done that. <clears throat> DEO will be holding an onboarding training webinar on August 12, 2021, from 9 a.m. to noon, providing information about the requirements that must be completed during the first six months of the subgrant agreement. In addition, DEO anticipates conducting an implementation training webinar in October 2021, providing more information about program monitoring throughout the life of the subgrant agreement. It is required that one representative attend both of the webinars. However, we encourage any employees or elected officials working on this project to attend the trainings. And they sent us the information. I'm going to turn this back over to the city manager and to the development department. But again, we appreciate the work that the staff has put in as well as our consultant and um, everyone. And we know that as soon as they work on the project and start implementing it, hopefully we'll have some great results for our city. Also received a letter from the Boys and Girls Club on a project that they'll be doing, which is called um, a review case for support. And they'll be meeting and having conversations with myself and others to make sure that the Boys and Girls Club is including the city of Stewart and including the needs of our entire community in their programming. So I just wanted to bring that up. The other thing that I wanted to bring up is that um, <clears throat> um, the Florida League of Cities is having their meeting, I think August 12th to uh, 14th. I believe, I'm sure that um, Commissioner Meyer is going to be going as our home rule person, as also as the um, member of the League of Cities um, official board. And um, I will be uh, con uh, thinking about going myself, so I'll have to get that paperwork in and talk more to city manager if we need any further representation. Unless any other board member, if we have the money, I. Um, to send somebody else to the Florida League of Cities meeting in Orlando. So that's coming up. Um, <clears throat> another thing that came up is that I'm a member of the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council Board because I was appointed from this board. They had a meeting last Friday, and one of the issues that they brought up was um, from communities within the Treasure Coast area, Palm Beach, Martin, St. Lucie, Indian River, Okeechobee, counties about which of their communities, whether at the county level or at city level or township level, had um, adopted uh, the May 20th um, date, which is the Florida Emancipation Day for a uh, holiday for their employees, or um, also the Juneteenth federal holiday, which has just been um, ordered and how that will affect their communities and how they're, um, if those communities are endorsing and adopting both proclamations as well as allowing for employees, whether it's a fort floating holiday or for some other way to accommodate those holidays. So um, we're gonna have a budget workshop, I think on this Thursday, and that will come up again. And I'm gonna try to get some of the other communities. There were several communities who had already adopted one or both or uh, um, as their, as an official holiday for their employees um, in the next coming budget cycle, because both of those are basically somewhat new this year. Most people were just learning about the May 20th uh, Florida Emancipation Day as an official time, as well as the, um, the Juneteenth. So we want to look at those for our budget for next year. So if they board members and members of the public would think about that so that we can have that discussed at the budget meeting. Um, 
I had a very interesting meeting with um, the head of the um, Housing Authority, the Stewart Housing Authority, Ms. Bartels from Fort Pierce. And as soon as we continue to work and develop a relationship and a good conversation, hopefully she's planning to make a presentation to us about how the Housing Authority works and how the federal grants work and how we can do um, more with them in Stewart and try to get to um, communicate with the persons whom they rent to in the city of Stewart. So um, that's it. It's not as long as I thought it was. Uh, oh, yeah, I do have one more thing, <laughs> Mr. Mortel. So there's an item on the agenda today. I think it's item number seven. I don't have that with me. It's regarding the abandonment of right away on the alleyway item. Is it item number seven? No, ma'am. It's um, number five. Five. Number five. And it's actually with here. So I live at 1008 Southeast 16th Court in Stewart, Florida. I'm the house that you can't see on the, um, what's that? The, on the Google because it's filled with trees. trees. You can't <laughs> see anything on my house, just trees. So my house doesn't show up on Google. But um, the alleyway for 17th Street behind me is being proposed to be abandoned by the city of Stewart. I'm completing this form. I'll complete it after um, today's meeting, the hearing. But um, this is form number 8B, and it's a memorandum of voting conflict. And I have completed this. And the nature of my conflict is that, like I said, I live at 1008 16th Court. The alleyway behind me is being abandoned and further the actual street and other areas have already been occupied by Martin County as a part of the um, runway airspace and the excess for the airport um, zone there. And that's also a closed off area um, behind my home. So I don't know if there's any other thing that I need to declare, Mr. Mortel. Um, first, the, the, alleyway enough, has, sir? the alleyway has not actually been abandoned. Um, that is the subject of the oh, resolution yes, tonight okay. as to whether to move forward on the abandonment or not. And because it could inure to a, a benefit to you, you properly disclose the Form 8B and we will file that with the clerk. Okay, that's, and that's your, thank you. It's been discussed, sorry. The abandonment has been discussed. Thank you, so I have that. Um, have I covered everything that I promised you I would cover, City Manager? Yes, you did. <laughs> have I did? <laughs> I just want to again, I, I, know I did not again, but I want to thank um, Helen McBride for bringing up a comment that she brought up earlier in our earlier meeting about cleaning up property. And as you can tell, we did have a lot of mess to clean up this week, whether from the water or from, from the streets. And um, probably need to do more as individuals to not create such so much waste, but that's another story for another time. Let's continue with the agenda, which would be comments from the city manager. Yes, Helen, we noticed that you weren't here at the last commission meeting, so. <laughs> um, I too just wanna thank uh, Ann Ellig for the river cleanup work that she did, as well as all of those who participated on Stewart's team to clean up. Wasn't a huge participation this year, but we're gonna change that next year. I think Ann's gonna cook some hamburgers for us or something, I don't know. <laughs> so we're gonna, we're gonna bribe people to come out to help us next year. Um, the, I just wanted to announce also, thanks to Milton Leggett and his crew and the tram crew, there is now um, at the uh, Wells Fargo property that we own, there is signs up at that location and a stop for the tram and that will be open for public parking for downtown weekdays after 5 p.m. and all weekend long. And on the busier days that we are having um, evaluated, there'll be a direct tram uh, path from that location to Haney Circle and back and forth so that we can use it as a larger parking lot and get people to downtown quicker. Excellent. Yay. Wonderful. Here, here. Milton. Thank that's, you. That's all I have. Thank you. Thanks. Um, before we go on to the agenda, I, I'm wearing my mask because, I don't know, I just don't want to make a cough and then somebody gets all upset. So I'm trying to do my best I can. 
Let's go to the approval of the agenda as published, unless somebody wants to add something. Move to approve. Second. Moved by Commissioner McDonald, seconded by Vice Mayor Matheson. Um, all in favor, do we get any comments from the public on the agenda? No, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, we go to the um, comments from the public, and I don't know if Mr. Mortel wants to give any recommendations or rules or regulations, but we have the rules of civility, and we're also making, if you make a public comment now, um, there are special items. If you want to comment on those special items, you can do it, or if you have to leave or something, you can make your comment now, and it will still count towards any special items on the agenda. Um, let me see. I just have, I, I, it says speaker number Madam one. Madam Mayor, just as a point of clarification, you guys are welcome to adopt that as a procedure, but we only discussed that for the for this thing, highway yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's not until August 9th. Yeah. But um, we have someone on item number six, and then just an open public comment, Mr. Walter Lloyd, unless you have it on a special item. You're allowed to speak on anything you want. Anything. I am not. Okay. I, don't know. I heard you say something about Kenner we'll Highway. I didn't know if that meant. I will <laughs> save your anything you say. But anyway, so I'm going to try and keep it as general as possible, but it does pertain to the process of this Kenner Highway project. Um, again, my name is Walter Lloyd. Uh, my address is on the green. I'll repeat it if you want me to. Um, I've just come in again to say that, you know, in retrospect, uh, I appreciate everything you all are doing. You are our leadership, you are our decision makers, and I just wanted to say that, you know, in retrospect, we're, we've, we've seen a situation where the city has been used to get around the laws of the county with an annexation. We've seen negotiations made and plans developed. We've seen, after that, citizens are informed by signage and notification. We've had presentations given with extensive pre preparation by the applicants, but relatively little preparation by the citizens, especially the affected citizens. Um, the city voted for approval at the first reading and acknowledged that we didn't have complete commentary by the public. So I applaud you for that, and I hope that we will continue to strive to make that part of the process. Um, we also did not have any expert testimony because we weren't aware that our opinions didn't count like an expert's did. So we've worked on that. You've given us the opportunity now. We will have that for you. Um, state approvals had that expert testimony been given, probably would not have even been pursued. And from what I'm learning from our expert and things like that, uh, that may not have had it been a process that was accomplished to this point. Apparently, we have gone around some of our city laws as well. Uh, I'm respectfully appealing to your leadership to represent us, allow us, hear us, and our experts through our experts, and make your decisions based on the total picture with everyone represented, please. Thank you, sir. And uh, by the way, the well, other recommendation from the expert was the book, uh, Strong, strong towns, towns, which is a good uh, indication of where our country, I believe, is going, trending, in the way that they're developing strong towns, and it's a bottoms-up approach where, just like we're asking, that we have a lot of involvement from the beginning to the end. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Lloyd, we normally don't comment in between when people speak, but I just wanted to thank personally thank you for allowing that book to be loaned to us, and I'll be passing it on to city manager so that he can pass it on to the other members of the of the board. Thank you. And I would like to offer, I'll, you tell me how many you want, and I'll get you more for every one of those individuals so you don't have to share them, because every one of you and every one of the planners should have them. Mayor? Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Bruner? 
I thought all of us had that book. It was put in our box. I read the book. Okay, well, I thought, I wasn't sure I what had received it. So. And um, I, I wanted to add on the back of that book is uh, what the foresight of um, some people here in Stewart like 32 years ago with Duaney. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, and how we got him here and got that start is what we've been doing for the last 32 years. And uh, uh, I was wondering who sent that book because well aware of what's in that book. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're at, that's it um, in terms of persons who have put in a card for general public comment. If there's anyone who has a general public comment that's not an agenda item where they want to speak at the time when the item comes up, you have an opportunity to do it now for three minutes. Thank you. Um, our next item is our consent calendar, which has um, three items on it. Madam Mayor, oh. I motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. There's, there's a motion by Vice Mayor Matheson, seconded by Commissioner Meyer. Um, any comments from the public on the consent agenda? City Clerk. Commissioner Meyer. Yes. Commissioner McDonald. Yes. Commissioner Bruner. Yes. Vice Mayor Matheson. <clears throat> yes. Mayor Clark. Yes. Our first commission action item is this right of way abandon for a portion of Seminole Street and Osceola Street, resolution number 70-2021. Um, Attorney Martell, would you please read the resolution title? This is resolution number 70-2021, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Stewart, Florida, declaring pursuant to chapter 36 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Stewart, Florida, the intention of the City Commission to abandon and to set public hearings on August 23rd 2021 at 5.30 p.m. and September 13th, 2021 at 4 p.m. in the City Commission Chambers to consider the abandonment of certain public right-of-way within the city, being that portion of alley more clearly described in Exhibit A attached here to and for other purposes. Madam Mayor, I'll move approval. Second. There's Madam a motion by Commissioner Meyer, seconded by Commissioner <coughs> McDonald. What's all these M's? I jumped the gun, but I, I, I have a couple questions if you'd like sure. to go through and give your presentation, Mr. Reitz. Okay, please staff. Can I, can I just announce that the, the, this is just the informative that we are announcing the, the actual process. There'll be an ordinance that actually comes back Absolutely. before you. So I don't know that staff was actually going to make a presentation today. I put it on commission action just because you're, we're making an announcement. So read the, we have to read the title in. Uh, Madam Mayor, Tom Reitz for the record. Uh, the manager is correct. It is intent to abandon only. We will be bringing this back to you on August 23rd for first reading. And I can answer any questions. Um, I guess it's not a question as much of a statement, and I know this is just an announcement, but I know I've brought up the uh, issue of alleyways in the past and us having more a more unified approach to them overall throughout the city. Um, the reason I'm motioning for approval of the announcement with this one, as you can see from the map there, that this is not a complete alleyway as it is, um, with the structure already on the, <laughs> on the subject alleyway, and the neighboring parcel to the east, uh, or the, I guess the attached parcel to the east with the pool running through it. So normally, uh, the larger discussion, I think, uh, maybe to be had at the actual ordinance uh, reading, um, I think if we have intact alleyways that are in the s middle of the city that could serve a purpose down the road, I think it's worth us really considering preserving them um, so that in the future they they would be very useful, I believe. But in this case, as, as we've already seen, uh, the alleyway not being complete, I'm in favor of it relinquishing it. So anyway, that's it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Any other comments from the board regarding this announcement? Any comments from the public? 
Miss Mac McBride. It's just a question so I um, understand. Uh, if we're going to abandon the alleyways, are we selling the land to the landowners? You know, like I remember back when they, in my neighborhood, they said they were going to abandon the, uh, the alleyways. And the, 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 one neighbor could buy 15 feet. And okay, if, I could, if I could chime in on that quickly before we violate the law. Um, we are not going to be selling the property to the landowner because that would violate the law. But we are allowed to charge what's called a privilege fee for the well, cost right. of doing so. It is a pure coincidence that that privilege fee in this case is the exact same number as an appraisal. Well, that's but right. they are not related in any way. <laughs> no, no, I just <laughs> want to be sure you know uh, that Everybody's treated fairly. Yes, that's but the, my, I right. think my main And now objection. the commission does have the ability, like what they did on the um, property with the uh, Molly's, house. Molly's house, where they can waive the privilege fee, or when the commission, under state law, is not going to be using the right of way, they there's a presumption that you're supposed to return it to its underlying owners. So in the situation where the commission were to waive an entire street without an application from a resident to do so, it would be more inclined to not have a privilege fee because that would result in one person could object and then the whole thing would not be able to be transferred. The intent of the commission would yeah, be I lost. I just wanted to be clear because we went through this one other right. time years, years ago. Uh, and I was here with Joanie. <laughs> so I know, I mean, we went through it once when I was much younger and now it seems we're coming right back to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other comments on item number four? Um, we need the clerk to give us a vote, or is it all in favor vote? It would be a roll call. Roll call, clerk. Commissioner yes. Bruner? Yes. Commissioner uh, Mathis? I'm sorry, yeah. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Vice Mayor Matheson? Yes. Mayor Clark? Yes. Commissioner Meyer? Yes. Thank you. Should I pass the gavel to um, Commissioner um, Matheson to handle this other item? You you don't have any. You you can. I don't really have any okay. big interest, but just to be sure. <laughs> I'll handle <laughs> item five. <laughs> the power of the gavel. <laughs> item five on Commission action: um, authorization to abandon right of way between 16th Court and Southeast 18th Street. Uh, Mr. Mortel, could you pre this is, please read the resolution? This is resolution number 72-2021, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Stewart, Florida, authorizing the abandonment of a certain right of way within the city limits being that portion of land which lies between Southeast 16th Court and Southeast 18th Street, which is more fully depicted in Exhibit A attached thereto, providing an effective datum for other purposes. Thank you. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner McDonald and a second by Commissioner Meyer on resolution 72-2021. Now that the item has come up, I'll again reiterate that I'm filing the form 8B and that I will not be, whether or not I have any great interest just in the, for caution purposes, I'm, I won't be voting on this item. Our mayor will be abstaining from the vote. Is there any public comment on the motion? We have a motion to approve. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Vice Mayor Matheson? Yes. Commissioner Bruner? Yes. Commissioner Meyer? Yes. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. And for the record, Mayor Clark? I'm abstaining. Abstaining. Thank you. And I'm filing the form 8B. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Testing is effective. Vice Mayor, you've passed your test. <laughs> thank you. Good Madam job, Mayor. Vice Mayor. This is a <laughs> um, There are no ordinances for second reading. On first reading, we have an appeal of determination of comparability at 728 Northwest Dixie Highway for use of the retail sale of vehicle parts together with vehicle repair with all the activities taking place within an enclosed building 
the property is zoned urban highway. This is a quasi judicial matter. And um, uh, city attorney, is there anything else that you need to read? Um, I don't need to read it. And although it is quasi judicial in nature, um, it's not going to be similar to a PUD as there's no burden of proof in this particular case from a standpoint of a uh, competent substantial evidence to deviate from the code, but rather in this case, um, it's a, an appeal arose out of a uh, code interpretation by the development director and the appellate uh, is a resident who uh, lives adjacent to the property and has filed an appeal. Essentially, you have some um, attachments that have been attached uh, by staff. I believe staff may have a short presentation, and then uh, Nick Schroth will have a presentation, and then I can answer any um, questions on a legal basis that you want, and then we can uh, move forward accordingly. Okay. Mr. Um, Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. Kevin Freeman, Development Director. Um, this uh, item is an appeal of determination of comparability uh, at a premises, uh, a plot of land known as 728 Northwest Dixie Highway for use of a retail sale of vehicle parts together with vehicle repair. With all activities taking place within an enclosed building, the property is zoned urban highway and located within the community redevelopment area. So determination of compa comparability, generally, a consideration of use is not specifically listed. Uh, if a use is not listed within a specific zoning district, then the use is not allowed. So the determination here was to as, try and establish whether or not the uh, use is particularly listed in this uh, allowable uses for the zoning district. So staff used the, the following items to um, as fact in making their decision, the location, the zoning, the future land use, and the uses allowed within the land development code. So the location is addressed as 728 Northwest Dixie Highway. It's located on the slip exit of um, Northwest Federal Highway, and which leads to Northwest Dixie Highway. The future land use, as I said, uh, reiterate, it's in the community redevelopment area and it's uh, future land use is downtown redevelopment. The zoning is urban highway and that's an important issue with this um, determination. It's abutted by urban neighborhood to the south and R3 uh, to the west. Urban highway is generally um, set out along US 1 Federal Highway, both north and south. Um, it encourages uh, highway-oriented commercial or high-density residential uses, and you'll s notice that where you do see a urban highway, there are large parking lots. From section 3.01.03.F.2, now, the urban code district uses, and there's a table within that section which relates to automobile repair service. Um, and I've copied and pasted the, the, the wording, and I think it includes a typo in there, but I included that. Uh, within an enclosed building in along US 1 Federal Highway and Savannah Road only. So the use of automobile repair service uh, within the code and the description within the code from a staff point of view um, states that it's in, uh, if it's in an enclosed building and the property is along US 1, um, it is permitted. Now it's important to note that this is where maybe a, a difference of opinion may occur, but staff take the frontage of this property, even though it's addressed on Dixie Highway that this property is along US 1 or US Northwest Federal Highway in that it fronts the, the uh, slip roadway which is um, named Northwest Federal Highway um, and that's both on the city system and on other systems nationwide. So the recommendation is to hear the evidence that's um, in front of you and determine to approve or deny the appeal. 
And from, with that, I will uh, hand over to the appellant. The appellant is Mr. Nick Schroth. And um, I know that I just briefly spoke with Mr. Schroth myself. I know that Mr. Mortel said that we did not have to do some of the things that we normally do, but um, I think it would still be appropriate if anybody has any had any ex parte communications with Mr. Schroth, or, uh, the appellant, uh, if they want to disclose it at this time. Um, and then Mr. Mr. Schroth will give his presentation. Any ex parte communication? Spoke with staff and uh, I have not spoken to Mr. Schroth about it. Uh, and I'm here with an open mind. I've spoken with uh, Nick and uh, with staff and I'm here with an open mind. Madam Mayor, I've spoken with Mr. Schroth as well as uh, our city staff um, about the decision before us. Uh, the mayor, I've spoken with residents, um, with staff. I have received communication from Mr. Schroth, but I have not spoken with him on the matter directly. And, and if the appellant would just tell me how to pronounce his name properly, even though <laughs> I've known you forever. <laughs> Sorry, Schroth. Okay. Thank you, sir. It's your turn to um, direct the details of your appeal to us. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, uh, commissioners, and thank you, staff. Uh, Nick Schroth, for the record, uh, 623 Northwest Palm Street is uh, my address. Um, as, as staff has pointed out, um, I'm here to appeal the determination of the um, of staff that this is a permitted use on this site. Um, in your packet, there's a there's a, a, a full argument that I've made uh, regarding that. I'll touch on a few of those points here and then, and then expand into a few others that I believe are, are pertinent to this. Um, so just to give a lay of the land, 623 Palm Street is, is adjacent to the property. Um, you know, when I purchased this lot and made the investment to build a home there for uh, my wife and I to live in and, and raise a family, we, we were very cognizant of the Rev Oil facility. It's, it's quite the facility. So we knew that that was something that, you know, we needed to keep an eye on, but, you know, we purchased a lot in the CRA because of the codes and the design guidelines and the intent of the CRA. And so, um, you know, I believe that those have been brushed aside here and, and that's what, that's part of my appeal. Um, as far as the, um, the, uh, <coughs> addressing um you know my my package appeals or you know discusses that and i'll get into a few of those points so um obviously with number five the, the address of the property is is dixie highway it has that address um i disagree with staff on number six access is from dixie highway in your in the package that i uh, provided y'all there's pictures of how the property is accessed from dixie highway there's a left-hand turn lane directly that accesses no other property from Dixie Highway except this property. Um, another large factor here is the letter that was issued by the city in 2016 to Mr. Branker. Um, it, it regards the loss of grandfathering rights related to this property. So in 2016, it was determined that the facility or the property had been shut down for a period of time such that any use there would have to conform to code. Um, I took great homage in this letter along with other neighbors um, who I think you'll hear from today as well in that the investments that I made in the area of this property were going to be justified because this property would be held to the code the same urban code that I'm building to the same urban code that anybody would have to build to the same urban code that is you know greater and and, and more thorough than regular codes throughout the city and the county because that's what we're trying to do here we're trying to you know redevelop this area. Uh, number eight, the urban highway zoning specifically restricts the use of auto to federal highway and Savannah Road. So that's important because it's not like we're trying to, you know, approve an underwater basket weaving operation here and that is not a use that the code specifically permits, but it's similar to another code, not another use permitted under the code. This use is specifically not permitted on this property. Uh, a couple other ones to touch on. Number nine, um, 
think I touched on this a little bit, but in order to access the travel lanes of Federal Highway, you have to travel at least a mile uh, either up to um, Wright Boulevard or south to Joan Jefferson Way to actually access a travel lane of Federal Highway. Um, and then uh, number 12, um, you know, I, I don't know that the um, characteristics of the, uh, of the use have been properly evaluated. Giant Oil is a fuel jobber, and if you're not familiar with what fuel jobbers do, they, they operate fuel distribution. And they have trucks and they have oil. Uh, they generally store oil in warehouse buildings, similar to what you'll find on the property today. So is the applicant or, or is the owner of the property going to be storing you know, bulk oil on this property? Uh, does that change the occupancy of the building? If all of the grandfathering rights of the property have been, have been lost, will the building's occupancy change from you know, whatever it was before to a level H hazard occupancy? And if so, what is being done to, to fire protect that building? What kind of life safety measures have been taken to you know, permit this use and, and, and how does that apply uh, or how does that conform to 2021 building code? Um, so that touches on a few of the things here. Uh, fuel trucks being parked on site. I don't know. Uh, in my public records request, I didn't find any relative, you know, information. If this was a public process, these questions, you know, could have been asked in a public forum, similar to what we have today. Um, stormwater improvements. Uh, it, it didn't appear that there was any proposed as part of this uh, plan. In fact, the or the property owner was cited for a code violation for for trying to trench into a neighbor's property. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's something that if, we're, if, if the building's lost all its grandfathered rights and it needs to conform to the code, uh, stormwater is a code requirement. You know, at new development, the new development that I'm doing, the new development that, that you're seeing in the city has, you know, stormwater requirements that cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, you know, we're required to make those investments and I'm happy to because it, it leads to a cleaner river. And, you know, that's really a goal that we all you know, hold very high. Um, 12, uh, 12.I says that the type and extent of impact on adjacent properties created by the proposed use in comparison to impacts from other uses allowed in the zoning districts. I, you know, I was never contacted and said, hey, you know, was this, is this a use that you would be okay with? In fact, when the Roosevelt Tire and Auto was sold to become part of the uh, assisted living facility up there, I was contacted by Terry McCarthy, who represented Roosevelt Tire and Auto, and, I, and he asked, hey, if we applied for a variance here, would you, would you be in favor of it? And I told him no, as I think other neighbors did as well. So that, that didn't happen this time around. Um, you know, Mr. Branker, who, who you know, is, is representing this property, uh, should have been aware of that situation. He was the address person in the letter from 2016. So, um, you know, I think there was just a changing of guard and the property owner took advantage of it. Um, <clears throat> so the use is specifically prohibited. And, and that's important because the application of a similar use doesn't, doesn't hold water in that situation, in my opinion. So, we, you know, again, we can't call it yoga if it's underwater basket weaving in this case. I mean, we, we, we could in that case, but in this case, this, the use is specifically required to be on Federal Highway or Savannah Road, and, and this is Dixie Highway, and it's a prohibited use based on the code. Um, I'd also like to touch on some of the matters that, that weren't addressed as well. Um, the urban code has very specific design requirements, and you know, again, when, when deciding to build uh, on the lot that we chose to build on, we, we knew those design requirements. We felt those design requirements would be applied to any kind of construction on the, uh, on the Rev Oil facility. And I feel like in this case, they were not. Um, so section 3.01.01A uh, says the purpose of the urban code is to encourage redevelopment. I don't believe we've complied with that purpose here. Um, Non-conforming uses, uh, you know, again, the, the letter from the city uh, in 2016 addresses that the, uh, the property has lost all its grandfathering use. Um, <clears throat> no building or other development, other land development permits shall be issued by the city development director unless all provisions of this code have been met. Um, so <clears throat> we'll touch on that. Applications are required to contain proposed development activities and design building plans front, rear, 
and side architectural elevations. There's been no elevations. I understand we're working with what's existing here, but are we, are we changing anything of the existing? Are we making it look any better? Um, I don't believe the applicant or the, the property owner in this case uh, made any of these ap applications and provided any of this inf information. Um, it shall be unlawful and a violation of the city code for any person to construct, renovate, or remodel. And renovate or remodel is important here, I believe. A building within the urban code district accepting compliance with the provisions of this urban code. 3.01.03, urban standards and regulations for desi designated urban subdistricts. Section D states the setback for the building should not be more than 10 feet. I believe the building does have a setback more than 10 feet, but there wasn't a survey included as uh, that I could see that, that um, you know, provided for that. Uh, the rear setback of 15 feet. The minimum building height is two stories or 26 feet. Well, the front building is a single story building. So are we, are we issuing a variance for this or, or are we not? Um, all parking areas should be located behind the rear facade of a principal building or screen from public right of ways. I don't believe that's happening here. Curb cuts, not more, worn, more than one curb cut every 100 feet. I don't believe we've addressed that. Uh, finished floor elevation, um, you know, there, there's a section of the code that requires that buildings get set to a certain finished floor elevation to avoid flood damage. I don't know if that's been uh, handled here. Again, touching on stormwater management, um, there really there wasn't a stormwater plan issued. There wasn't a, a, a permit for stormwater improvements, to my knowledge. Um, public art, not a part of the package. Uh, landscape buffers are to be 25% of the setback. Um, I know there was a landscape plan provided. I don't, uh, I don't believe it conformed to this code. So, you know, that might be something um, staff could take another look at. Um, Section G2 does give the development director some latitude to work around existing conditions, but it really doesn't lessen the requirement. And, you know, part of this uh, requirement that street facade of a building shall contain hedge potted plants or trees planted in public right away. I know, I know that hasn't happened here. So, um, you know, I'm wondering what, you know, how, how that was uh, dealt with. Um, architectural standards and regulations, you know, this is a fairly, fairly big item here. There's a lot of things that are required. There's really, we put a lot of weight in this when we decided to build there because the CRA would generally require a prettier building than you would get elsewhere in the city and certainly in the county. So, um, you know, things like, uh, things like the mansard roofs, um, you know, windows and doors. I, I don't know that there was anything that was submitted that showed that either what's currently there conforms with code or what they're proposing to replace conforms with code. Um, building colors and finishes. They've, they've proceeded to paint the building white and blue, similar to an Exxon station, and I, I don't think that meets the code. Um, so, you know, I, I, even sidewalks, um, I don't know that the sidewalk, there is a sidewalk in front of it, I don't know that it's six feet. Um, all building and site lighting shall be decorative. Uh, they replaced all the lighting there, it was not decorative. Um, Rooftop facilities such as air conditioning units as well as exterior mechanical equipment shall be screened so as to not be visible from public view. You can see the rooftop AC units on this property. They've proposed no mansard or any kind of, you know, remedy to that. Um, so, you know, the, the code's also pretty specific in what is allowed as a minor conditional use, and that is specifically public art and architectural materials. Everything else is a major urban code conditional use. And, and I think it's important that we recognize that the use that they're proposing is just not allowed. The other items that I've pointed out today are where you know I take additional issue with the determination. And this property is gonna require variances to be used and, and that's fine. I have no problem with variances, but the process that should have been taken is a major urban conditional use and that would have allowed, you know, public input. It would have allowed, you know, hey, I can't move this building. I'm trying to reuse it. It's only one story. What can we do to, to help? Okay, well, let's come up with ideas and, and let's let's figure it out. This this property will require, um, you know, some some public input and some variances. And and I want to be very clear that I'm not 
an anti-variance person. The code did not, was not built around the Rev Oil facility, but um, there are certain things in the code that are, that are you know, not to be deviated from in my mind. And, and I think it starts with the purpose and the intent of the, of the code, and that is to foster redevelopment in areas that, that merit redevelopment. So thank you for your time today. Uh, happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Thank you, sir. Um, staff, do you have any questions for Mr. Um, Schroth? Uh, I don't have any questions for Mr. Schroth, no. Do any of the commissioners have any questions for Mr. Schroth? Mr. Schroth, what year did you buy the property? Bought the property in 2018. And um, Mr. Meyer? Um, I, I don't really have a question for Mr. Schroth. Um, I mean, I have a few comments, but, well, I guess I have a question for staff. Um, so this is my first time with an appeal like this. Um, just for our purposes up here, are we looking to uh, make a motion to grant the appeal and then make a recommendation that it go through a the appeal has use? Been, the, the, pursuant to the pursuant to the city code 8.07 it says that a property owner has the right to an appeal or appeal an administrative or decision by a staff member so he filed the appeal as a as as background the app the documents attached from by by mr freeman in the uh staff item is in fact uh Kevin's determination of comparability that was entered, I believe, on May 4th or 5th of 2021. Mr. Schroth had 30 days from the entrance of that to file his notice of appeal, which he perfected and did, in fact, file within that 30 days. Originally, the representative of Giant Oil had taken a position and written a letter saying that he objected to Mr. Schroth filing his appeal because it was untimely because Giant Oil took the position that it had been granted this determination of comparability some time before and therefore the 30 days had run. That didn't end up coming to fruition or any evidence of that being produced and in fact there was produced and because Giant Oil took the position that it was based upon the fact that they had been issued a permit. The permit that was issued by Tom Reitz which is also in the agenda packet in the last sentence of the permit very clearly states this is not an administrative variance this is not a determination of comparability etc and rather that is something that has to be obtained later which demonstrated that it came now so the appeal has been timely filed by nick the, the appeal is before you as a board now and this is what you're appealing the question before the board is did the development director have the authority to grant the determination of comparability? And if so, did he f properly follow the code in so doing? And, 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 and making that determination, you would say, not could you differ with him, but because anybody could differ, but it was his finding reasonable and within the confines of the code, or could someone have drawn that conclusion? First issue raised by Mr. Schroth was, and, and, and Mr. Freeman pointed out that his, the, the code itself in section 2.03 says that the determination of comparability can be made at such time, or I'm sorry, 2.02.01 A, it can be done uh, if the use is not specifically listed in the code. And Kevin's position was is that the use wasn't listed. Mr. Schroth's position was the use is listed and the use is listed and says it's specifically not allowed. So first, I guess the board's first decision would be <clears throat> to determine whether or not they believe the um, development director had the authority to make the determination do, do based we? upon the code itself. So in the code it says if the, if the use is not a listed use, then the development director can do a, whatever it's called, the determination of comparability. So is that language that was posted in the code sufficient to make it a listed use or a not a listed use? And if you look at the code 2.03, and I'll pull it up right now if I can. I have it pulled up. Okay. I have a question, Mike. Do With any motion we do to 
grant or deny the appeal, do we need to do a series of finding of facts as part of the sure. motion? Is I guess is what I'm at. Well, I mean, that's what he's trying. You're going to deliberate yeah. it, right? So at such time as you guys, whatever the motion is, the, the motion is to determine the sky is blue, and then the other commissioners are going to discuss it. And I'm going to say, well, I think the sky is blue because of the water vapors or whatever. So, so during that, the, the findings of fact are determined. If in fact you guys feel you need a basis for your motion or a finding, then it would be encouraged, because yes, the more findings of fact, the easier it would be for either to challenge or not challenge it. Um, but it, in 2.02.01, it says, consideration of use is not specifically listed. If a use is not listed within a specific zoning district, then the use is not allowed. However, a proposed use that is not listed within a particular zoning district, but which is determined by the city development director to have character, similar nature, and impact to a permitted use in that district, the city development director may make a determination of comparability to the applicant. So then if you go down into the uses in the chart at 2.02.02, .02, table two land uses, and you scroll down, you find that it says, um, bear with me. I'm still scrolling. Uh, it says, automobile repair services, comma, major and minor, refer to supplemental standards. Next one, automobile sales provide all repair and services shall be done with an enclosed building, referred to supplemental standards, section 2.06.05. And when you go to the next chart, which I'm going to, is what the one that says that it shall only be used or only be done in a uh, enclosed building on US 1 or Savannah Road. So the question is, first, is that a use that's listed or not listed? Because I, I believe that the u proposed use is not listed based on what? what okay. I disagree. Um, could you, okay, just let's let Mr. McNall finish. His I mean, thought, it's not please. listed as a permitted use. It is listed, though, and that's that's where it gets to the point that in the the first sentence that Mr. Mortel just read that dictates whether it should go through the commission right. as a conditional use permit or whether the development director has the authority. Um, but basically. You know, in section 2.02 .02 of our code, use is allowed in zoning districts. Section A, consideration of uses not specifically listed. This use on the property is specifically listed. I, I think we can all agree on that, right? I mean, that's the first part we'd have to decide. Is the use specifically listed and the use that use of an automobile repair facility is specifically listed in section 3.01.03 of our code. Is that correct? I think I agree that it is specifically listed. However, it is listed in such a way that yeah, makes not, it not a permitted use. Yeah, exactly. So I, we're finding fact. It's specifically listed. As a not permitted And it's use. only permitted on US 1 Savannah or Savannah Road. Road. Okay, so one. we've established that it's listed and it's only allowed on US 1 and Savannah Road. So the question is, is it on US 1 or Savannah Road? Or and on that's, uh, and that's the time. findings of fact that we have to examine. Right. And well, and this is our CRA. This is, <coughs> frankly, I, my answer when I look at all the data presented and I also examine the, the letters from, from the city going back um, and the property, the justification with those letters that the property has lost its use. grandfather in of that certain use, mm -hmm. I, and the fact that the land owner of the property was paid when the new Roosevelt Bridge adjusted US-1, that that landowner was justly compensated by FDOT 
to remove that US-1 frontage and the address changed, that when I look at those, those facts now, I cannot say that it is on US-1. I agree. Madam Mayor, just if I could, because we have a sonographer here, I just want to make sure our, our own attorney has, has suggested that we first deliberate over whether or not Mr. Freeman has the authority. Is that what you said? First, well, we need for, to do that? As, as a hypothetical, if I were to say to you that I have completed the Costco PUD and there's no need for a second hearing because I went ahead and filled one out. Can we I've use another it. example, please? Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, you would say I couldn't do it, but, okay. but I would say, let's say I completed the Azul project and right. there was no need for a second hearing because I signed the documents and went ahead and filled it in the way I thought it was appropriate. That's really easy. Everyone would see that and say, Mike Mortel does not have the authority to do that and therefore it must be reversed, it must be canceled. So the question that, that Mr. Schroth has raised right. is does the development director have the authority to do a conditional review or a, de a determination of comparability in this case? Right. Does our code award him the jurisdiction to make the determination in this case? Well, the only, the only language that is instructive on that is that initial language in the 2.02.01 uh, that, that uh, Commissioner Matheson read and that says the, um, if, it's, if the use is, consideration of use is not specifically listed. If a use is not listed within a specific zoning district, then the use is not allowed. However, a proposed use that is not listed within a particular zoning district, but which is determined by the city development director to have a character, similar nature, and impact to a permitted use in that district, the city development director may make determination of comparability to the applicant. So, so it is that's listed. A, uh, well, that's my permitted. point. It is a listed use. But it's not permitted. Right. So the question is, what, does that give Mr. Freeman the authority to make the right. decision, the but the, what the code says is if it's not listed. Exactly. Correct. So That's the issue. It is listed and it's not allowed in this location. So the only way by our code that it could be allowed in this location is if it came before the commission as I an agree. additional use permit. I agree. Unless we were to de determine up here that the address is different well, if than you Dixie Highway. If the address is different, then that's, it may be a different zoning district. That's what I'm trying to, maybe before we go through like the finding of fact on the merits of the argument, I think the, the question we just have to, like the easiest solution here is just to say we don't agree because it is listed. So um, the, in this case, the, uh, you know, we would say that the development director does not have the authority to grant the... Agreed. In if it instance, wants to come back, it would have to come as a conditional use. In this instance. Or what? Anything else? I mean, there could be another method, I guess, but. Um, so, so is that Mr. Mortel? Yeah. So do we need to go through the second step? Well, I mean, no, let's. For what it's worth, where is it not listed? No, it is, it is listed. listed, but it's not permitted. Okay, so it's listed in the overlay zone for one of the urban districts or for the urban district. So if you determine its address to be a different address, let's say you determined its address to be on Indian Street, then that overlay zone wouldn't apply because it would have a different address than the address. So its location does matter to some but extent. But the parcel does carry a zoning regardless of whether we say right. it. The parcel the itself zone. carries right. a zoning. And that's what we're looking at. And right. it's listed in that zoning. So I just, you know, when this, to get a, so that we don't get ahead of ourselves, if this might come back as a conditional use, I think we just simplified and say, you know, I would make a motion, maybe you can help me, Mr. Mortel, that the, that the, as, as this use is indeed listed, but as a not permitted use based, on the as it's listed, just leave it at that, that 
the development director does not have the authority to And then you guys could make the and vote on that. Okay. Correct. I'll second that motion. Um, City Clerk, could you please clarify what you've heard from Mr. Meyer? And this is just for a finding of fact, right? Right now we're not, it's not a grant. Yes. You, yeah, that's just for the finding of fact. Good, okay. Just want to make sure I know what we're voting on. Yes, I she's going to repeat it. As this use is indeed listed, but not, but as a non-permitted. Let me, let me re reword. Okay. Because the use is, uh, as this use is, is indeed listed, comma. <laughs> in. As a permitted. Uh, uh, in the land development code. In the land. Section. Okay. 3.01. Point oh three. What he said. Point oh one. Point oh three. You beat me to Municode. I'm usually the Municode guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I gotta watch myself. Um, uh, I move. Authority. Yeah, I move that the that the uh, development director did, did, does not have the authority to grant the use. Does not have the authority. As per. You know, to yes. grant the use. I'll second. And again, I second that. And, okay, can I now right. ask a question of the development director? <laughs> Madam Mayor? Yes. Hi, Mr. Freeman. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to throw you under the bus. I am under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now. You're over at the cabin, they have a t-shirt with tire tracks. <laughs> if you would, you know, you know, I'm just... Based on based yes. on our discussion and what I'm reading, I see it as being listed. Therefore, my motion. Can you, if you would, please describe your reasoning as to whether it's listed or not? Okay, I I believe it is listed. Okay, um, it is listed for the Herban Highway. The question, from my point of view, does that property front Federal Highway or does it not? And my determination is based entirely on whether that property fronted Federal Highway or not. I see. As to the um, actual permits required, this is not granting permits. This is not granting development. So all the issues that um, Nick, quite, Mr. Schroeder quite rightly pointed out, the processes that we, we need to go through would still be in place. Okay. That would be um, also, there's another piece to this, is whether this becomes part of our review process because it's not substantial renovation. The amount of um, renovation works that were proposed did not take it above the 50% renovation threshold. Right. So that's another complication to this where staff could really not engage with the site design and planning because from that moment that that came in, that inquiry came in, the, the cost that were, we were provided with did not cross that Didn't threshold. Didn't meet the threshold, okay. Once that cost crosses that threshold, then all the issues that uh, Mr. Schroth elus elucidated on, not elucidated, um, what <laughs> were, um, would come into effect. Okay. And that, you know, Thank that you. property would then need to address what the urban code required it to do. Can Thank I you. ask a question just for the for people who might be listening? The entire history of this property with the remake of the new bridge and change in the roadway, <coughs> it has always maintained the address of 728? No. No. It's not maintained the address of 728 Dixie. In its history, it has maintained the address of 728 North Federal, Federal Highway. Highway. When, the, when the community redevelopment overlays were first put in place, I believe this map that actually is attached to the um, determination identified it as uh, fronting um, Federal Highway. Are there any other clarifications that we need to? Um... I, I, I feel I should just, as a point of clarification to that discussion, it should also be noted that what happened here is obviously the 
drawbridge portion of Dixie Highway was originally US-1 from Maine to Key West. Mm -hmm. In roughly 1996, the new Roosevelt Bridge opened and the Florida Department of Transportation purchased a bunch of property in order to do that. For example, Sunset Bay Marina was known as a restaurant called um, Ray's. Ray's at one point, but in front of that was the one that was uh, right up on US-1. Neither of those addresses are now US-1. They're different addresses. They're Atl Atlantic or whatever that is. Our code at section 8.04.00 is, is entitled uh, non-conforming lots caused by eminent domain proceedings. And the condemnor or condemnee of an eminent domain proceeding may apply to the city development director for a certificate of conformity relative to a remainder parcel which has or will be created as a result of an eminent domain proceeding. What this parcel actually is, is a remnant of an eminent domain proceeding that was deemed a non-grandfathered or non carried forward because they were paid for the loss of their gas station and retail store on US-1. It then sat empty for a decade or so, and they came in and wanted to be grandfathered in. We wasn't grandfathered, and then they come forward. The question is, when the commission looks at a property that's grandfathered because we change the zoning for one reason or other, you say, well, what happens to that structure? Does it mean they just can't use it ever again? And that would be a taking if you did that. Unless, of course, it was a taking and you paid them for it, which is what happened in this case. And in that situation, when that happens, our code provides a standard, and the standards which um, can be followed by an applicant to get a certificate of conformity to be issued, which include filing an application, paying the fees, um, De preventing the severance or business damages relative to the remainder parcel, which was shown and reduced by the issuance of a certificate of conformity, so they could have chosen then to accept the use and then not gotten paid as much money. And then a development plan for the remainder of the parcel has been prepared and approved by the city development director, which minimize, or minimizes the nonconformities caused by the eminent domain proceedings and which is otherwise consistent with all requirements of the land development development okay. regulations of the city, which is what Mr. Schroth was pointing out of. In this particular case, one of the things in this urban overlay zone is that the frontage has to be at least 60% of the width of the property, but this building was already built. So the question would become, well, since they didn't spend 50% of the money, therefore do they stay remain grandfathered in, or do they need to spend 50% of the money to make it 60% of the width of the lot? And you get into these complications because this isn't a standard situation where a property was just grandfathered in by a zoning change. It was actually a taking that took place by FDOT and they elected to keep their remnant parcel. They waited a long time and then said, hey, we want to use our parcel just like we used before when we got paid for it. And that's kind of what happened. I, yeah, I, I think that, I mean, that's some good information, but from where, from what I can see, I think it's still, it still is as simple as. What's the address? Right. right. Well, no, not even because again, the address, the, the parcel has a zoning. The address you can act, you can access it from anywhere, whatever number it has, and it doesn't matter. It on the map, it's got a zoning and a future land use, so that is what that's what it carries. You know. Well, again, it's listed. That's the issue. The use is listed, so I think we just... And, if, and, and for the record, if the address was US-1 or Savannah Road, there wouldn't need to be a determination of comparability because it would have the address of US-1. It would just simply get a permit because right. it exactly. would be an allowed use. Exactly. And that's, yeah. that, exactly. that's it, exactly right. It, the address does matter. The frontage does, does matter, and it is not on US-1. The original landowner was paid... The information, if it's correct in my packet, is $284,000 for that frontage on US-1. And when the- To be removed from To US be removed 1. from that. And then now his frontage is on Dixie Highway, but he was justly compensated for that frontage. So then do we need to clarify the motion? Okay, that makes sense. So do we need to clarify the motion? I, I think the determinant compatibility 
is still the wrong vehicle for this. The determin of determination of compatibility is what's being appealed here. Right, we're just doing a finding of fact for, right now. Okay. It was the wrong vehicle for this process. If, if the applicant wanted to change his address from Dixie Highway to US-1, I, I don't know what that process is, but the determination of compatibility simply says, if the use is not listed, the development director can say, underwater basket weaving is similar to a yoga studio, I'll allow it. Right. Auto repair facilities are specifically restricted to US-1 or Savannah Road, and that's not a de that's not a determination of compatibility, that's a determination of address. It's 628 Dixie 728 Dixie Highway in the city's GIS system. It's 728 Dixie Highway on the letter that was issued in 2016. And so therefore, you know, the, the city's historical pattern has been to treat this as Dixie Highway ever since the construction of the Roosevelt Bridge. And that's that's where I feel the determination of compatibility was not was not an available avenue for this. There may have been another available avenue, uh, a major conditional you know, use amendment would be would be fine. That process, you know, can can run its course. It involves public hearings. We we would at least know what was going on. And so that that's you know what I'm asking is that the 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 commission determined that the development director did not have the authority to to issue a determination of compatibility here. It was not the appropriate measure. And, uh, Thank you. And, um, can I say something? Yes. Um, I I just wanted to to do some housekeeping. So our issue is uh, a determination of comparability as stated in our guidelines, not compatibility. I know that Mr. Schroth has said that. Comparability, and I wanted to also recognize that we do have uh, Ms. Kathy Enlow, the court reporter here um, from Esquire here today. And, um, and also I wanted to ask Mr. Mortel, unless um, Vice Mayor Matheson feels like he's already said what he said, I want to ask um, uh, our, our <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask um, our city attorney if he wants to reread what um, M Vice Mayor Matheson read in section 2.0.01 which is really the crux of the matter. And I wanted to make sure that it's clear. I know the commissioner um, read, I think a portion of it and we, it's, in our, it's in our record, it's in our package. But just to be sure that that's the crux of the issue with regard to the determination of comparability, if we needed to actually read that into the record as to the issue of what we're talking about with the, um, the uh, the decision of the, um, the the written published decision of the um, growth management director, the development director. I mean, it's it's the, the pleasure of the board. I'm happy to read 2.02.01. .02 yes, sir. Please do. Okay. 2.02.01. Uh, .02 generally, it is the purpose of this section to identify the uses allowed in each zoning district. Open parentheses. Table two. Residential uses business uses and public service, industrial, agricultural, hospital, and PUD districts uses. A, consideration of uses not specifically listed. If a use is not listed within a specific zoning district, then the use is not allowed. However, a proposed use that is not listed within a particular zoning district, but which is determined by the city development director to have a character, similar nature, an impact to a permitted use in that district, the city development director may make a determination of comparability to the applicant. Conditions may be placed on the decision. A determination by city development director that a proposed use is not similar to a permitted use may be appealed according to procedures in Chapter 8. In making such finding, the city development director may assess all relevant characteristics of the proposed use, including but not limited to the following as applicable. A, the typical volume and type of sales, retail or wholesale, size and type of items sold, nature of inventory of the premises. B, any processing done on the premises, including assembly, manufacturing, warehousing, shipping, distribution, and any dangerous, hazardous, toxic, or explosive materials used in the processing. C, the nature and location of storage and outdoor display of merchandise, whether storage is enclosed, open inside, or outside the principal building, 
and predominant types of items stored, such as business vehicles, work in process, inventory, and merchandise, construction materials, scrap and junk, and raw materials, including liquids and powders, hazardous or not. D, the type, size, and typical massing of buildings and structures associated with the unlisted use. E, transportation requirements, including the model modal split for people and freight by volume type and characteristics of traffic generation to and from the site, trip purposes and whether trip purposes can be shared by other uses on the site. F, parking requirements, turnover and generation, ratio of the number of spaces required per unit area or activity, and the potential for shared parking with other uses. G, the amount of, and nature of any external effects generated on the premises, including but not limited to noise, smoke, odor, glare, vibration, radiation, and fumes. H, any special public utility requirements for serving the proposed use, including but not limited to water supply, wastewater, pretreatment of waste, and emissions required or recommended, and any significant power structures and communications towers or facilities. And I, the type and extent of impacts on adjacent properties created by the proposed use in comparison to impacts from other uses allowed in the zoning district. Thank you. And I went to that painstaking um, thing because I don't want, after we've made a decision on this, that we say that, ah, oh, there was one little item, E, F, G, H, I, that we didn't consider or that Mr. Freeman didn't consider or that Mr. Schroth did not um, address in his appeal. And I just wanted to make sure that that main area, as well as, of course, section 3.01.03, um, that we also um, have previously discussed. But I wanted especially because that part about the, the, the um, the extent of where Mr. Freeman has um, the ability and the discretion to do something. And I think that we've flushed out whether or not something was listed or not, um, that we are there. So that's why I wanted to read that for sure, to make sure that we did not miss something depending on how our decision making comes out. Mr. Meyer. Um, I just, I wish I had my whiteboard because I, I think in pictures and uh, it's, it's just, it's very clear again. Thanks for rereading. Um, the motion was that the development director did not have the authority to make a determination of, com of comparative comparability because the code says the de development director may do that if it's not listed, period. There are other ways that it could have gone through. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's our job to deliberate those. The appeal is that he did not have the authority to make the determination of comparability. The address doesn't matter either because if the address were correct, he wouldn't need to make a determination of comparability because it would be an allowed use. So I, any way you approach it, any direction you approach it, this is not the appropriate, he, 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 the development director does not have the authority to make that determination because it is a listed use that closes the whole case. So. Thank you. There was a pre previous motion. Is there any other discussion? And yes, should we... because I just as a point of clarification, when Commissioner McDonald said this isn't the closing of the whole case, this is just a finding of fact, the board reached a consensus. So if, if that we need to address that motion, is the motion intended to be a conclusory or just a finding of fact before oh. moving forward? Do or I need I can make a new motion? Well, there's yeah, a motion on the floor. On yeah, you can modify. Let's if vote wanna, on the motion. And we if can... you want to modify that motion to your to. Well, grant we did say it was a finding of fact. You're right. So right. So let's, let's just do that and then have a motion on a grant or deny. Okay. Are you making a uh, change, Troy, so that he no. can? No. No, no. The motion was to. As a finding. As of a fact. finding of fact. That the development director did not have authority. As a finding of fact. So is there public comment? Um public comment before that vote, I guess. Um, yeah. Is it seconded, um, Troy? Yes. Yeah, I seconded okay. it. Okay, all right, thanks. Any public comment on the staff or the applicant wants to make a comment on that first? Public comment, yes, sir. Oh, hold on, did you send up something for item I number? I did, I did. Chris <laughs> Klein, on the adjacent property to the north of the Chris subject Klein, property. yes, thank you. How are you? Thanks. Uh, thanks for allowing me to speak tonight. I mean, I think it's 
Nick did a great job. Thank you, Nick. Without Nick, I wouldn't even have known this was going on. I bought the property five. Chris, six, could you speak in the mic? I yeah, can't I hear bought you. the property just in the north five, six, seven, eight years ago, and I remember doing my diligence. I've been in commercial real estate for 33 years, and I remember specifically saying it wasn't going to be an automotive-related use, and made financial decisions based upon that. When the Roosevelt Tire got absorbed by the ALF behind my office building and wrapping to the north, Terry McCarthy approached me and asked me if if they would. If I would object to an automotive related use next door, I said, Terry, I've known Terry for 33 years. You know, I don't, you know, it's not a use I think is appropriate for a CRA. So I think it is all about the address. I'm at a Dixie Highway address. This is a Dixie Highway address. It does front US 1 if you've got a fire truck ladder. You know, I mean, you've got to get, you know, 50 feet up, you know, an embankment to get to US 1. So, and I work with Kevin all the time, and I think that there was, you know, something that went awry it was specifically the address because that was important to me when I bought my building. I've got another project planned for the back of my building and, and I'm not going to put it next to an automotive related use. So to me, it comes in also comes in the intent of the CRA, putting dollars into these, you know, infill projects to make you know, like what Nick did to his house. It's just beautiful. I don't think he would have done it if it, he thought this would be an automotive related use. So the use matters, but I think that's for the next steps, you know. I think right now, I mean, I get up, if they want to make a special exception or whatever, a major amendment to the to the CRA and apply, I, you know, a lot of these comments will be more applicable, but uh, it is about the address in my mind. And I just appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Since you got me out of the house this late, I had to speak. So. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Thank you. Blair Scott. Good evening and thank you. I'm speaking to you as a property owner on Palm Street, Australian, and also Stewart Avenue. Um, also coming to you guys as a person who grew up in Stewart, Florida, and uh, happy to be back. So really excited to see the progress that's been made over the past several decades. Um, so I, I first of all just want to say that I agree with everything Nick Schroth said. Um, I think he made very good points um, about the address. It is in my opinion, and just with general optics on Dixie Highway. And I think that is the matter that is kind of in, in contest right now. Um, but just as a high level, I just want to say that the use as proposed um, by Giant Oil, it doesn't really seem to comport with the vision of S the city of Stewart and uh, the CRA as it is going forward. Um, there's a couple of environmental concerns, and as uh, Vice Mayor Matheson echoed earlier today, he was concerned about the environmental stakeholders in Florida. I am one of those people. And uh, I am concerned about the environmental use, the oil, and I am also concerned about their potential past issues with uh, complying with uh, the city standards um, and how they would continue going forward. Um, and also to echo uh, Mayor Eula Clark, uh, we are worried that we are creating so much trash. I am also worried that we are creating so much trash and I think a better use of this area would not be for another oil place or a vehicle automotive repair but maybe something just a little bit more environmentally friendly which would also uh, kind of comport with the the vision of Stewart and a lot of the residents within it thank you thank you thank you Ms. Scott any other members of the public who did not present a card on item number six who would like to make a comment at this time based on our conversations so far and the motion that's been made any other commissioners before I ask for um, the clerk to call the roll okay I'm going to close this discussion um, we've heard from the staff we've heard the discussion of the commissioners and we've heard from the appellant Mr. Schroth um, No further input. Clerk, this, would you... This is just the finding of fact yes, motion. Yes, yes. Yeah. Clerk, would you so. please call the roll? Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Commissioner Meyer? Yes. Vice Mayor Matheson? Yes. Mayor Clark? Yes. Commissioner Bruner? Yes. Yes. Now I'll go ahead and move to grant the appeal. Hey. <laughs> All right. <laughs> There's a motion and a second. Is there any member of the public who has... Uh, uh, um, can I just clarify what the motion was? <laughs> <laughs> to grant the oh, appeal. Oh, to grant the appeal. <laughs> you want to say something, Mr. No. Meyer? Um, Sorry. Okay, can you, um, okay. can Mr. Um, Mortel read the appeal? Do we need to read that again, Mr. Mortel? 
appeal the determination of comparability at 728 Northwest Dixie Highway. Um, do you want me to read Mr. Schross's entire appeal? Or do no. You... <laughs> it's not a resolution. It's not a resolution, but just, so, just a title again that they're granting. This is an appeal of a determination of comparability at 728 Northwest Dixie Highway for use of retail sale of vehicle parts together with vehicle repair with all activities taking place within an enclosed building. The property is zoned urban highway. Thank you. And that motion was made by um, Commissioner McDonald, seconded and by- for, And for clarification, the granting of the appeal is to rule in favor of Mr. Schroth's objection to the use. Yes. Or to the determination. determination. Right, yeah. not to the use. Right, to the to determination. The determination. Okay. Right. By, the, by the development director. It sounds like to whatever it might sounds come like we're splitting hairs, but you know, it must, later. My, it must driving by right, right. My antenna are up when I see the stenographer, no, so we need we, to make sure. We this is new ground that we're doing here, and um, it's uh, thank you, Kevin, for your thoughtfulness in looking at this this manner, and also thank you for your thoughtfulness, Mr. Schroth. In um, this will help us to hone everything that we need to do in our infill redevelopment and in, in dealing with our code and other areas. So thank you. And Madam Mayor, if I may, I just want to say for the record that, you know, we've heard public comment on the, on the use itself and the CRA and the vision. And again, just to be clear that this motion is solely about the development director's use of the determination of comparability. We're not, we're not going any deeper than that. So. Yes, thank you. And that, that's why I made sure that we reread the, the item. Clerk, Madam Clerk, uh, again, is there any public comment? Or is there anything on Zoom, Mr. Paul? No, ma'am. Yes, sir. Thank you. Madam Clerk? Mayor Clark? Yes. Commissioner Bruner? Yes. Commissioner Meyer? Yes. Commissioner McDonald? Yes. Vice Mayor Matheson? Yes. Thank you. We have tread new ground. Thank you very much. Um, item number seven, chapter 16, emergency management. Uh, yes, this is ordinance. This is the uh, first reading, reading of ordinance number 2468-2021, which is an ordinance of the city of Stewart amending uh, chapter 16, emergency management, providing for severability clause and a conflicts clause, providing for an effective date and for other purposes. Um, as a brief background, uh, as you know, the governor signed Senate Bill 2006 into law on May 3rd, uh, and in that he made specific changes to, or the state legislature made specific changes to the ability for municipalities to enter emergency orders, including but not limited to restricting them to uh, seven days, they must be renewed, no more than 42 days in a row, and um, if in fact one expires, you can't just renew another similar order. Uh, as it relates to health, the hurricane uh, and police actions are exempted from that. Um, and it's ironic because we're facing another uh, potential increase in COVID responses and everyone's going to get to test this thing pretty soon. But the intention for our purposes of amending it were to do twofold. Number one, to be very clear that the city of Stewart intended to have a emergency management program related to health issues and secondly to bring it and make it um, similar to or consistent with the state law that was adopted thank you i just just as a comment as you mentioned with regard to the health issues and the potential covid um, expansion or increase uh you know people have been asking what are we going to do locally what are we going to do at the city level and of course, we have these kinds of, I don't know, obstacles or whatever you may call it sometimes. Uh, so. Are there any comments from the, the board? I'm going to move to approve, but I'm just going to make a comment at the same time. It's just another attack on home rule. Yes. And it's just uh, another example of the legislature taking our abilities to uh, <clears throat> the ability for us to govern our community mm -hmm. as our community sees Bit, so mm -hmm. I, I'll second that, and I agree. We don't have too much option yeah. here um, <clears throat> yeah, to, to reject it. 
Yeah, but we're probably worse off if we reject it. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I'll second the motion to approve. Good stuff. Um, any comments from the public? Ordinance number 2468-2021. We have a motion and a second. No I should also com mention that uh, Summer our summer intern had a significant role in writing this ordinance, and this is her last meeting, she so she's here, here to, she's here just to see you guys she's, adopt she's her work on her way out the door. She's here for fun today. This was, by the way, this was supposed to be the second COVID, or yeah. the second Costco meeting, really the reason for her extending her stay, but we disrupted that. Yeah, I'm sure this won't be her last published legislation. Yeah, let's right, have a she'll probably get others in the future. From summer. Well, thank if you, you want to come sit in my seat for the Costco meeting, you're more than welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, oh, it'd be a great day to, reason to take off. Where, where are you going? Go back to school. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, there are no public comments on um, ordinance number 2468-2021, which has been moved by Commissioner McDonald, seconded by Commissioner Meyer. Matheson. 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 Madam Clerk, do we Commissioner need? Commissioner Bruner. Yes. Commissioner Meyer. <clears throat> yes. Commissioner McDonald. Yes. Vice Mayor Matheson. Yes. Mayor Clark. Yes. The next item is a discussion and deliberation of a proposed amendment to the city's land development code for extending or removing the deadlines of the amortization period for non-conforming post signs within the city limits. I will give up my rights to the vice mayor. No. <laughs> um, any um, uh, staff, please? Yes, um, Panal Gandhi Savda, CRA Administrator for the record. Um, the reason this item is coming before you is because our code requires that all poll signs have to uh, come down or be removed by January 1st, 2022, uh, which is only five months from now. Uh, so that's why this is um, coming before you for direction to staff. Um, staff identified that there were approximately 280 poll signs uh, within the city limits when we did the windshield survey back in 2016. Um, so we did a recent study uh, to identify how many signs um, are still remaining and or how many si signs that have been removed. And uh, we identified that approximately uh, 90 signs have been removed or replaced with a conforming sign. Um, so, but there are still 190 uh, poll signs remaining within the city limits. Um, the code does prohibit any new signs going up, any new poll signs going up since we adopted the ordinance back in 2007. Um, but however, uh, the code does allow replacement of a, a sign face uh, without altering the sign area or the structure. Um, and so we do, uh, we do let the applicants or per, um, the property owners know that if they are altering this, uh, the sign face, they do have to bring it to compliance by 2022. Um, staff is requesting to consider extending or removing the amortization deadline um, because of the pandemic uh, and how all the businesses have been affected, um, causing financial hardship to many businesses. Um, there is a concern that uh, the businesses would have to pay as much as $20,000 uh, to replace the sign. Um, so therefore staff is suggesting that we either add five more years uh, to the deadline, uh, to the amortization schedule, or remove the deadline completely, considering that uh, poll signs will continue to um, uh, reduce over time, uh, as we saw in the recent study or the survey. Um, the commission could consider changes uh, to the LDC amendment, uh, to the LDC to speed up the transition. A um, couple of suggestions are uh, we could enforce removal of damaged non-conforming poll sign um, that require repair, should be removed within 30 days. Um, as we saw in the case of Tropic Tint, we saw that the post was still there. Um, so the, this would allow us to uh, code enforce that to be removed uh, within 30 days when the sign is damaged. Um, and also modify the standards so that the property owners have to uh, remove the signs within 30 days if the property is abandoned or vacant. Um, so in a case of like a, the flower shop in Colorado, um, they have a pole sign and um, uh, they, could, they did the face change. 
uh, because they didn't have to any alter the sign area or the, uh, the structure. Um, but if we had this uh, provision, then that sign would have had to come down because that flower shop was closed more than 30 days. Um, so staff is looking for direction to either maintain the deadline uh, for removal of non-conforming pole sign by January 2022 uh, and promptly notify all property owners impacted by this uh, decision. A uh, second option would be to return um, with a draft amendment to the LDC, extending the pole sign amortization by an additional five years. So that would bring us to January 1st, 2027. Uh, and also make the codes and uh, changes that staff is recommending to, um, you know, to expedite the, the removal of signs. And third option would be to return with the draft amendment, eliminating or removing the deadline uh, with code changes to accelerate <coughs> sign removal and notify all sign owners. So staff is looking for direction on um, those options. Thank you, board. I'm interested to know how many times we've had a deadline and extended it. This so in, I, in 2007, uh, we failed to notify the property owners. That was a 10-year um, amortization period. Um, so when we came to 2016, uh, because we failed to notify the property owners in 2006, uh, 2007, we decided to give them five more years. So we've extended it once in 2016. Okay, so it's had the one extension and now we've had the pandemic. Yeah. And um, uh, Ms. So Gandhi so stopped us. Gandhi. So me, me and Commissioner, I'm to think me, about it. me and Mayor Clark Gandhi were here when we extended yeah. it and yeah. there was a lot of conversation at the time about, about the cost. Uh, businesses were just starting to come out of the, uh, out of the recession um during the recession there was no money to do signs um i'm I don't, i'm a little bit torn first of all i don't know if i would have back in the 2000s when uh, whenever this ordinance was passed i don't know if it's something i would have supported or not you know hindsight it's easy to sit there and criticize somebody no, no. To, i think mike i think you probably voted for it right i did <laughs> um, i still support it what's that i still support it and um so but at the same time, so as far as the, my concern about uh, abandoning a deadline is the folks that went out and paid to get their signs mm -hmm. fixed mm -hmm. and bring it up to conformity. So just bringing it to a, into a, uh, turning them to, to a purely non-conformity, I don't, I don't know if there, I think there's a, an inequity there. Yeah. Um, at the same time, we're, we've just gone through a year and a half. Um, business is coming back, but construction costs are quite high. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I, I mean, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm torn. There's, there's many options that I could go with, and, uh, and I'm torn on which one it is, to be honest. Um, uh, because it's because it is a hard decision to for some of these property owners. At the same time, a lot of these properties are owned by are by owned by REITs and large you know large property owners that could have done it and they haven't. So yeah, and so um, I I the part about the the money the lack of funding is important and I think that we want to have that theme and that branding of having signs a certain height, size, where they're located, and all the things that go along with the, the, the monument sign and the type of uniformity, that's mostly um, more noticeable in the CRA area. And that area has funds where they can get some money to help them. But there are other people who are outside of that area who don't have those kind of funds. And yeah, maybe they could be people who own large areas of land and they could do whatever, but they're not doing it. But I think um, if we can see those people doing something in the CRA area and getting help for it, and other people are not getting help for it, plus we've gone through a year or 15 months or more of COVID, 
and we don't know exactly where the economy will turn. And I don't know how um, essential this is if we don't punish these people. Um, so I think that if we can extend it, extend it, and if there's some way to, if we need to help people since there's help available for those who are in the CRA to get help with this kind of thing, if there's a way to create some incentive um, uh, for those who are outside of the area, then, you know, during that time period, we would have time to to think about it and give them some options and maybe just a fact of time, they would want to um, comply and maybe be more like the rest of the area, especially within the more compact CRA area where we can see the difference in how the signage is working and how it's um, helping with the compatibility. So I don't know, I'm, I'd, I'd, I'd be for extending it i don't know about five years but maybe we could extend it for is can we only extend it by five year increments or can we do other times the commission has the discretion to do literally whatever it wants you could you could you could simply say that they're prohibited but there is no deadline to take them down and grandfather like you have other uses and then just let it by attrition you know those that go away get rebuilt and uh Ms. Savdas Gandhi provided you with the list to demonstrate what historically, or Gandhi Savdas has, has been uh, happening. And I don't know the numbers and I don't know how many each year go down, but it sounded to me like it's roughly 50% of them have gone away since the extension. So. What was number C? <laughs> I think that's what I'm for. Uh, the option C is to uh, just eliminate the deadline completely. Eliminate the deadline. So, and make, make some code changes. To eliminate the deadline. Well, uh, are they looking for a motion or? Oh no, maybe right. we're not. So just this is a D&D. They're looking for some direction. Right, and we're looking for direction, and we would come back with the LDC amendment based on the direction. I apologize. I try and put myself in the shoes of our prior commissioners um, just to see what why this was undertaken and i guess it's one for safety after a hurricane a monument signs more structurally sound um i i do understand that and that i equate to what we did in our cra with trying to harden and put put you know power lines and utility lines underground the other you, it, it followed a a presentation and it showed clearwater florida and it showed all the sign pollution essentially of being bombarded by signs and then it showed how that same I-60 corridor in Clearwater had been converted to monument signs and I still have the picture in my office and it is a much more pleasant presentation of the road it just looks greener and it doesn't have it doesn't look like Las Vegas well but then I go back to just what we saw today in the CRA meeting with a the, you know for instance the, the tropic tint sign um, on a pole at 15 feet high in the same you know width compared to a monument with the basically the equivalent width and still 15 feet high I don't see any that much aesthetic difference um, I would understand if we put a height limit or restriction more than that on the monument signs um, and so I don't see the huge advantage, but I also wasn't here when the decision was made and I didn't hear that presentation. I wonder if it's left and the deadline occurs as it's written, then our, our city code would, would go out and, and code enforce these or would they, as it's written, be grandfathered in and allowed to continue just non-conform? No, they would. Um code violation the letter that we sent um, back in 2016 um, clearly stated that they have to be removed or um, they would be code enforced okay I don't knowing my fellow commissioners I don't think we're willing to go down that route I, I don't like that but I also hear what Commissioner McDonald is saying that you know some of our local businesses have gone above and beyond and spent their money to conform to this request by our prior commissioners. 
and if we just eliminate altogether, we're not being just to the businesses that have stretched their own finances to conform to what their prior commission wanted. And, you know, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm torn. I don't want to set a precedent that we continually extend a deadline, extend a deadline, but, you know, if we do something and, and a lot of the businesses listen and, and try to meet that because we're trying to, to beautify the city and make it safer during a storm, and then we just forget about that and wave it for all those that didn't do anything, I don't, I don't see that that's being very just. Um, and that's why I would lean towards realizing that the pandemic hit, having staff bring back ways to accelerate the program, but, but taking into consideration the pandemic and giving an extension, an extension of the, an the five years. Uh, um, what are yes. you going to do if another hurricane hits another couple of years, destroys businesses, rips their roofs off or whatever? We're going to keep doing this? Under the code, the, the distinction is if a hurricane hit right now and knocked everybody's pole sign down, they even couldn't. with an extension or otherwise, they wouldn't be able to put a pole sign back up. The question is, is the city commission January 1st of 2022 directing staff to send 190 letters out and telling these people they're going to be code enforced if they don't change their sign out in 30 days? Or is it going to extend that deadline to a different time frame? I, I mean, I, I am, part of me is apt to just remove the deadline altogether, as you suggest, Commissioner Bruner. But the other part of me says if we do that and we remove all deadlines, then, then what about all the businesses that, that have conformed and have spent their own money? Just, I mean, even we just saw, we did approve Tropic Tint. You know, um, $7,000 of that is their money, even though they're in the CRA and they, get, they have that advantage of being in the CRA, $7,000 of that is their money to switch and go to a monument sign. Now, if we go right now and say, there's no more timetables, so forget about it all, it doesn't matter. Are we being just to them or any of the other businesses that tried to, to work with, with what our prior commissioners um, established? Madam Mayor, if I may. Yes, sir. I, I, after listening, and, and I think that uh, they're, they're already a non-conforming use right now. So if they have to, re something comes up and they have to replace it, they can't put a pole sign on it. I would be happy with doing an extension of X amount of time, say two to three years, but changing, you know, creating some, I guess, you know, the carrot and the stick, the incentive to, to in order to get that accelerated. I do, um, I think some of the options uh, were a little aggressive, but maybe something in between, uh, not doing anything to encourage folks, but something that's that says if it's you know if the property is vacant for a certain amount of time or something that we just, they have to go ahead and remove the sign. The, the damage signs need to come down. Um, certainly some of those things uh, I think that we could do. I'm not sure, uh, and I wouldn't want to sit up here and decide right now what each and one of those are. I think that's something that is going to take some time to for staff to develop. But this way it takes off the the burden of the uh, that's been created by the higher construction prices that have been created by the pandemic and at the same time creates a little bit of incentive to speed up this process. Aye. Thank you, Commissioner McDonald. I, I, I certainly agree about the vacant properties. If the property is vacant, you know, the, the, there could be a time limit for, for yeah. that sign. The, and I don't know the full what sign be. entirely being removed, they don't necessarily need to put a monument sign up until the property is occupied. Right, exactly. I mean, I, and I'm not sure, sure what that time frame should be. I don't. I think 30 days is probably a little bit short, just because that's just the transition from one tenant to another. Yeah. But six months, a year, you know, three months, six months, nine months, don't know. And and again, um, you know, this is a discussion. So I think that from our perspective. 
just kind of giving if we can come up with some uh, you know some consensus we can direct staff to come back with something that uh, that we can that will work and we can deliberate on in earnest recognizing that there is code now so one of the proposals you could give is for staff not to bring anything back I mean it, Right. recognize that it could be the outcome doesn't result in any ordinance coming back so don't rely on that as the method to solve it later but also recognize the second meeting in january this room will be full yeah exactly oh yeah well, we just kicked the can again oh that madam mayor yeah okay, i'll ahead, just I'd, I'll just weigh in i guess i i'm not i'm not in favor of code enforcing properties um i for me the ideal scenario would be that they be non-conforming, that they are replaced over time when the property is sold or if the sign is uh, uh, damaged or, yeah, or the property is vacant. Um, you know, I, I can't, I try to think about what the prior commission was, was intending to do with this. For me, this is not necessarily my approach. Um, you know, I, I think it's a little heavy handed. I think it's a little more of like the condo commando approach of local government. Um, I don't think pole signs are particularly attractive, but also to your point, Vice Mayor, you can make a monument sign look unattractive as well, and it's a heck of a lot more material and concrete and heat. Uh, so, you know, I think that's it's being a little too, um, a little too demanding. But in any case, you know, as a business, as a former local small business owner who was targeted by this. Uh, by this signage issue, even though we did not have a pole sign, strangely. Um, I know there was some confusion around it. I would just say, you know, overall, generally, I think monument signs look better. They probably are increasing the property values. So those folks that went ahead and did it, they are good stewards of their property. They are, you know, good citizens and complied with the local regulation. Um, and the benefit to them also is that, you know, generally I would say that their property value probably did increase as well. So, um, you know, I would be much more care at let's, let's have them be non-conforming. Let's not start code enforcing. Okay. I mean, do you think you have sufficient direction, Ms. <laughs> <laughs> I think she adequately got every single option. <laughs> Uh, one other spending, thing, though, that you may consider, too, is what, what are the types of signs you're talking about? As we have this discussion, sometimes we have a tendency to think, okay, this is a mom-and-pop business in a, in, a, in a little coffee store. A lot of these pole signs that are still up are the pole sign that's in front of the plaza that has Home Depot, the grocery store, and four other giant anchors in it and 17 little people in it. So I don't, I, I think the type of use matters too because if it is the one person on colorado boulevard that's a hard pill to swallow but if it's a sign that actually is a pole sign incorporating 17 different businesses on it mm -hmm. and they could divide the cost of that by all the businesses associated with that plaza or for example the plaza that's being done on Publix re being redone over here would go to a monument sign anyway as these plazas get renovated but again, I, I throw that out there because I don't know what, you know, what signs we're trying to save or not save. Okay. Any well, other we don't discussion? exactly have the, the option to discriminate on, on the, the financial. I don't disagree. We can't pick company. and who choose, but right. right. Those little mom and pop shops, those are twenty thousand dollar signs they have to put up. That was just a, a higher number that I provided, but couldn't Monument signs forward. are not they, cheap. I mean, right now they don't have to do anything because they don't have to make any change at all. If you, even if it's $1, they're putting out something, right? I mean, no matter what, it would be something. I had no idea they were, they were that much money. Well, and it depends. Are they going to have them lit? Are they going to use the higher quality? Or, you know, there's lots of bonuses. They're going to put an LED in it, yeah. like, uh, the, like the Methodist Church did. Right. <laughs> if I can, so I know I came up with this idea? didn't mean to screw the pooch Jeff on this, Costco. but... Again, um, the uh, the idea that you know you would see a thoroughfare and it's you know that dreaded scenario of Clearwater with all of the pole signs and we look like Las Vegas, that uh, that's not going to come to fruition. That couldn't come to fruition with 
the approach that I'm advocating for because it's still in the it's code. Already, it's already been cured. So it, you're not, it's not, we're not gonna have new ones. Mike, uh, how, how about this as a, trying to, trying to just direct, her, so staff, ha, so staff doesn't have to come up with 32 different ordinances. <laughs> um, what if we go ahead and just eliminate a deadline, make them non-conforming, but look at the what can what it makes them non-conforming vacant lot for a certain period of time uh so make that adjust Accelerate. can we do that yeah i mean you could make it so you can't even change the sign out inside so it. basically option three yeah y yeah option three i think some of the stuff was a little bit too aggressive but i think we can adjust that when we come back yeah so well, is, if i if that works for everybody from a from a uh consensus Right. Yeah, I think that I'll throw that out. How do you uh, feel about that, Vice Mayor? I'll I'll support that. I mean, I, I just okay. I'm hearing that out of the four. Let's go. In my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we haven't spent you, enough you, time together. You got <laughs> it. I'm trying to draw it out. I'll support. I miss our long got, meeting. Why don't we try and draft it right now? We still uh, got four go. or five members of the public <laughs> here and a couple of members of staff. They want to go along. Helen missed the last meeting. We got to give her what she came for. Come on. Commissioner Bruner had this wrapped up 15 minutes ago. Commissioner Meyer, I have another meeting this week for you. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, you have enough. I'm glad I still now. love you yes. guys. Okay. No other comments? No public comments on this discussion and deliberation? No. Thank you guys. 4.30. Budget. Budget meeting is at 4.30 on July 29th. I'm missing another meeting for that, but that's okay. It's supposed to be um, at Mary's shelter. Um, this meeting is going to be adjourned momentarily. No other comments? Adjourned. Thank you, Mayor. Dragging it out.